right? Thank you guys. I guess I'll take the mic first. Is this good volume? I sound loud myself. Is this, we good? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Dan Kruger, Invictus Capital, like uh, Dan said, we're local operators. We manage in-house. Uh, we've been operating in here since, uh, we started separately, but together we'll dive into what our story is. Uh, Invictus, that started about 2019. Um, so I'm Dan Kruger. I come from a corporate finance background. Uh, I got into the real estate game in about 2018. Uh, so we can dive into a little bit of that, but I'm going to let Anthony introduce himself first. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to take that. A, you usually hog the mic, so um, I thought that was going to go sure, a little bit longer. Right. Okay. Sure. Cool. So I'm Anthony Vecino. Um, so I'm curious for you guys that are here, generally, like, we, we don't know what we're going to talk about. We're just trying to figure out what's going to bring you guys the most value. So before we talk about ourselves, I, I kind of want to understand where the room is at generally. So raise your hand if you're new to real estate, you're looking to do your very first deal. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, raise your hand if you've done a couple of deals, like small single family duplexes, triplexes, and you're trying to figure out how do I do more of that or how do I make the jump to larger apartment buildings? Raise your hand. Cool, that's all of you, sweet. Perfect. So we can help. Um, hopefully share a little bit of our story. I started with a triplex, F FHA, house hack that bad boy. Um, one month after I bought the thing, I get called in the middle of the night by a frantic tenant who's like, SWAT's here. And they're gonna kick down the door. I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, but it turns out it wasn't SWAT. Um, turns out it was bounty hunters, which is way cooler. But they don't talk about that in books. Like when you're reading about how to be a landlord, like how to go out and invest in real estate, they don't talk about how you're gonna to have to deal with bounty hunters at some point. Um, but that's how I started, that's how a lot of people start. Very quickly you start to realize though there's a glass ceiling with duplexes, triplexes, and they're fantastic, they're awesome. But the problem is they're not very stable. So if somebody moves out, then if you have a triplex, you're 33% vacant and all that cash flow that you're getting and you're running to the bank and cashing those checks and you're really psyched, it just kind of dries up and now you're coming out of pocket. So I think most people at some point, if they're in the game long enough and they don't burn out, they think, well this is cool, how do I do it bigger? How do I get more stability by buying bigger assets? How do I get cash flow, the appreciation, um, and all the tax benefits? And so that's what we do. Hopefully we can share a little bit of our journey and that can accelerate your path. Uh, it's not, it's not the most complicated thing in the world, but it's not very easy. So that's the whole premise of our brand. Whether it's the podcast, Multifamily Investing Made Simple, or the book, Passive Investing Made Simple. Like just realize that if you understand the variables that matter and how to pull the very few levers that actually run a deal, you're gonna do pretty well. Um, so just know whether, wherever you are in your journey at this moment, like don't be scared. Like, we were all there at some point. Um, kind of rewinding real quickly about myself, the thing that you have to know, if you haven't figured out, is that I have really severe ADHD. And this was like super, super problematic when I was young, came out of college, and I was like chronically fired, like from every job I ever had. Like they were like, you are not good. I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I really am not very cut out for this world. So I had to go do my own thing. Uh, that led me for the better part of a decade being a professional rock climber. And then I started, that doesn't pay very well, by the way. So like, sounds really cool, but it just means I lived in the dirt a lot. Climbed at places like VE way back in the day. It's actually where I started, not that one, but back in St. Paul. And there came a point where my life kind of imploded on itself. My fiance left me, found myself living in the back of a van, not by choice, $80,000 in debt. Rock bottom, was like, and rock bottom sucks, but rock bottom's kind of cool because you have nowhere else to go but up. And so a buddy came to me and he's like, hey, let's build a business. I was like, what else am I gonna do? I'm not busy in my van. So we did that and <laughs> figured out like, I really like building businesses, it's a lot of fun. Um, and it helped me really get control over my ADHD and start to focus it in a way that was productive. Because so many, I think probably a lot of people resonate with this is that you probably feel like you have a lot of potential and how do you close all the different doors that you could go through and find the one that means the most and go through that door? Like, that was my big struggle. Um, fast forward 15 years, I've built and exited multiple businesses at this point. Um, real estate, I started in 2012 with my little, my little triplex. Actually, I, I did a house hack, or no, I did a fix and flip in college, and all I learned is that like, I can swing a hammer, but I can't hit the nail. 
So like that was never going to work for me long term. Um, but my real estate career started in 2012, buying little stuff. Dan and I joined forces in 2019, and that's really when we sprung board, sprung board did into large multifamily. So 20 to 60 units. We have about 40 million in assets under management right now. Is that about 270, 270 units, something like that? Um, we're on pace to double this year, so we'll be at 500 by the end of the year. And we've done that largely through using our own money, but also through joint ventures and syndications. So we don't just syndicate, we also do a lot of joint ventures, which given where a lot of you probably are in the room, that's probably the best place to start. Like that's how Dan and I started was like joint venturing with friends and family, going doing deals, and then using that to springboard into syndications later. So um, I'm done. Cool. Well, Anthony's got more of an interesting story than I do. I have um, more of an average one, I guess. I went to college. So let me back up a little bit farther than that. I grew up in a family of artists. So in my house, uh, parents went to art school. My sister went to art school. Nobody went to university. And everybody ended up working jobs that were, um, you know, at best like a trade, but basically no one was really making money from art. And so they were basically we're kind of operating on minimum wage. So that was kind of the household I grew up in. Very kind of scarcity mindset, clipping coupons. And the, the, the most important thing in my parents' eyes was to go to actual college. And when I say actual college, I mean like university. And get some kind of job that would get you, or, or get some kind of degree that would get you into the corporate world. And I remember when I was younger, my, my mom was very upset one day. I must have been like 10 years old. And she was, you know, just beside herself upset because she was trying to figure out how to pay for our health insurance. They didn't get benefits with their jobs and so she's trying to wrap her head around how to do this and she told me I was like 10 years old. She's like, Danny, get, and no, by the way, nobody called me Danny. There's one person that calls me that and that's my mom. She's like, Danny, do me a favor. And you. Um, do me a favor, get a job at a big company that gives you benefits so you don't ever have to worry about this. And she was very upset and that's been like ingrained into my mind since I was like 10 years old when this happened. And so it took a while for me to actually do anything with that. But as I got older and getting into college age, I was very focused on finance, making money, financial security, stability. These were things I was just obsessed with. And so I went to college, studied finance, thinking, hey, if I study how to make money, um, that probably improves my odds of knowing how to make money when I get out of here. And so I got into the corporate finance track and spent about five years there before I realized that that just wasn't doing it for me. It wasn't serving me. After about a year, year and a half at every company, um, I was looking for the next thing. And I realized about three or four years into it that I was actually really entrepreneurial, which uh, was surprising to me. Um, but I realized that, and it was around that time that I started looking into real estate. Um, I went to college around 2008, so I still had this kind of real estate equals risky thing in my head. And so I never really dug into it, but I started doing that because I started a, a side hustle in the corporate world and was just going deep into self-development and entrepreneurial books and it didn't take me long before I started stumbling on books that touched on real estate and I just got hooked quickly which I am sure you guys can appreciate. No, I was doing, uh, it was effectively consulting, I was into uh, nutrition coaching, I was really into fitness and so I was basically telling people how to eat burgers and drink beer and still be in decent shape. That was kind of my thing. Anyway, so it was a lot of marketing, a lot of sales, a lot of just business development stuff. And then I eventually kind of started to run out of content because I'm just listening to audiobooks all day at work while I'm still working my corporate job. And I stumbled on that book. And I was like, I'd heard about it. It sounded so cheesy, but then I actually listened to it. And that was the gateway drug, honestly. It sounds so cliche. I kind of hate to say it. Uh, but that was the, one of the first little ventures into that space. And then I kept going. And the more I learned, the more it just made so much sense to me. Um, so I got hooked pretty quickly, started shopping for properties, and then it was uh, 2018, I got the first property. It was a six unit over in St. Paul. And the, uh, there was a reason I picked a six unit. As some of you, or maybe most of you know, the valuation methodology changes above five units. And that was a big factor for me. So I identified uh, a six unit that I, I got for $475,000, put probably about, yeah, this was, <laughs> this was back in the day. It wasn't that long ago, but. Trust me, I got what I paid for, it was rough. Um, but put like probably $75,000 into fixing it up and then refied it uh, for 600 grand about nine months later, then went and got an eight unit down the street. And we've just been doing the same thing ever since. Just incrementally getting bigger and bigger around that third or fourth deal, friends and family started to get involved. And then pretty shortly after that, it made a lot of sense to look at the syndication model. 
uh, because we noticed that there was a lot of deals passing us by. And while we were waiting for that refinance event to get more capital to go do the next deal, we had to pass things up. And simultaneously, all these people around us are like, hey, can we just give you money and you can do this for us? And we're like, yeah, I guess. Sounds like a thing. So that's how, <laughs> that's how we got into it. I mean, we didn't start out with a goal of being syndicators. Uh, honestly, I started out wanting to do it all with my own money out of ego. Um, but then realized it was a hell of a lot better to own a piece of something really big and amazing than own 100% of something that's sort of small and okay. So, shove the ego aside, move towards the syndication model, and that's what we've been doing ever since. So, I'm curious from you guys, at least the guys that raised their hands for trying to do your first deal, uh, does anyone want to uh, you know, pop up and say exactly what they're trying to get into? Are you trying to buy a smaller property to run on your own? Are you trying to raise capital from people? Are you trying to partner? What, what is that first deal? Those of you, I think I saw at least like three hands pop up earlier. Small multi-family by myself. Small multi by yourself. And what, uh, I'm not trying to pick on you or anything, I'm just, I, I love more engaging things like this where we're actually having more of a conversation. What, what's kind of the thing that you're looking for? Something here locally? Yeah. Nice. And what are you kind of struggling with? Do you have questions about you know, how to lock up that first deal, whether it's like how to find the deals, how to actually take it down, how to get the debt, how to actually run the thing? Everybody wants, everybody wants to know how to find deals, but um, I'm kind of, I have a deal under contract right now, but it's going to lock up all my capital. So going on to the next one is kind of ending up being the question mark. I don't have necessarily the, the refinance isn't necessarily going to be right up front and I might not be able to get all that money out to be able to just continue to Sounds That sounds very familiar. For those of you in the back who didn't hear it, uh, what was your name? Jake. Jake was basically saying that he's concerned about having that capital locked up until he gets to that refinance event. You know, what do you do for the next one, two, three years while you're waiting to get there? Uh, I think that's a very good question. Anthony, do you want to talk a little bit about, about how to find deals in this market? It's, it's a hot market. I know how we No, do. no, I don't want, I want to talk about something else. <laughs> I'm going to go my own way. I go on my own path. <laughs> Real quickly, on the book question, that's a fantastic question. What books are really impactful for us? We do a series on the podcast every week where we go into a book, deep dive it, and give like our impressions of why it was so impactful for us. And then you can download what we call the sophisticated investor notes. It's just like a beautiful infographic that Reed puts together, puts it all out there. So you don't actually have to read the book. You just read the paper. For you, what was your name, Jake? Jake. Jake. My so here's the question, like, why do it on your own? Here's the reality of every business that I've ever been a part of, is every business that succeeded was off the back of a strong partnership, and every business that failed was off the back of a bad partnership. But in both of those cases, in all the businesses I've done, the variable is always people. Your ability to go far and fast in this business is gonna be predicated on your ability to work with and through other people. Every deal, you guys have heard this, every deal needs three things. You need somebody who has the time, somebody who has the experience, and somebody who has the capital. Not all of those have to come from the same person. And the situation you're about to find yourself in right after you close this deal, you're, all your capital is gonna be locked up. So you might have time to go run the, the building, and you're gonna be building the experience of actually how to run the building, but you're gonna have a capital deficit. And you're gonna need to figure out how do I get over that, otherwise you're going to grow very incrementally and very slowly. Because here's the, here's the hard truth. Right now, interest rates, what are interest rates at? They're just going up, going to the moon. Who knows if you can refinance in two, three years, right? Like, might not make sense, right? And so what worked before might not continue to work moving forward. And we do not like to, like, we do not underwrite our deals based off of a refinance. We, we always do them, but we never, we never bet the farm on that happening. We never present to our investors, hey, we're gonna do a refinance in year three. Because if interest rates go to 10%, we're not gonna do a refinance in year three when we have long-term debt locked up at 3%. We're not gonna do it, probably, right? He's the numbers guy. <laughs> and guys, don't get freaked out about the interest rates. We're still historically all-time lows. Don't. With, with inflation at 8.5% and you're still able to borrow money at 4.5%, you're being paid to take out money. Like, don't, don't freak out. But my, my challenge when you're starting and you're fig like trying to go, how do I make the jump from where I am to where I'm trying to go? It's probably people. It's probably people. So the bottleneck, if it's people, first starts with you 
in your skills, because you will never outgrow your skills. And right now your skill is, I don't know how to effectively work through certain types of people, whether that's capital partners or other operating partners or whatever. For some reason you have a block there that says people are hard, and it's true, they are. If you want to grow, that's how you do it. It took Dan a while to figure that out. Dan? One year. <laughs> well, one year is a long time. When it I was. Met, I wasted a year, basically. When I met Dan, you had 30 units, 34 units? 64. No, no. When I met you, you had 30. Then together, we did, the, we did Duluth, and then that was 60. Yeah. So when we met, 30. Now we're at 275, two years. Something like that. The power of partnership is massive. And if there's nothing else that you walk away from here today is figure out who, not how. If you guys haven't read that book, go read it. Benjamin Sullivan and Tim, no, Benjamin Hardy, Tim Sullivan. Really good book. Figure out who are the people that you need to surround yourself with that would enable you to go to that next level. Uh, so how we met, um, it was interesting is we weren't, neither of us were looking for partners when we met. At least I don't think you were. Yeah. Uh, like I mentioned before, I was, uh, when I met Anthony, I'd realized that partnering with people, whether it be passive investors or even potentially like a business partner, um, was really the way to grow. Um, like I said before, it's a limiting factor if you're trying to do everything yourself. And uh, we, we met at an event, but we weren't looking for partners when we were there. I mean, we were looking to meet people and grow our network. We were looking to network, but neither of us went in like, hey, let me find a business partner to team up with. Um, and he and I are both really introverted. And so uh, I got to this event. I'd just gotten back from a vacation with my wife. I was really tired. Uh, we were in Europe, and so I was coming off of a, like, that flight, fresh off of that. This was a 9 a.m. event. I think we got in at like 3 in the morning or something. So I was just like, all right, I'm going to do it. And I walk in this room that was uh, probably, I don't know, twice as big as this maybe. It was, it was a large event, a few hundred people. It was the North Star, by the way. I don't know if anybody was there in 2019. So, yeah, um, and so I walked into this room, and it was, it was full, right? It was circular tables all over the place, and I'm looking around, these tables are all full, everybody's knee-deep in a conversation, I'm like, I don't want to wedge myself into one of these conversations, like, that's not my comfort zone at all. So I see this table way in the back, which is one dude sitting at it, I'm like, okay, that looks like the least intimidating thing. It was this guy. Uh, so I was like, I can handle this. I'm not that social, but I can go up and start a conversation with one guy. Like, that's, that's not that hard. So we sat down and started chatting. Nothing earth shattering at first. It wasn't like love at first sight or anything like that, but we just got to chatting. Oh, shucks. All right. Uh, so we just got to chatting and we did the usual networking thing. Like, we grabbed lunch during the event. We we're like, all right, let's, you know, catch up, grab coffee, get breakfast or something, and just keep talking. Like, still no intent of partnering. And it was after meeting up a, a couple of times, maybe like, I think by like the third or fourth meetup, we were like, okay, we gotta at least do a deal or something together. What we noticed was we both had offsetting yet complementary skill sets. So the things that I am good at and I enjoy were things that Anthony maybe isn't as strong at or doesn't enjoy as much and vice versa. And that's a really powerful combination because what happens a lot, and Anthony's got a story for this, is you tend to gravitate towards people that are a lot like you and where you have the same skill sets. Um, or you're too much alike. And we've seen this in relationships, like personal relationships. If you've got two people that are exactly the same with one another, sometimes that could be uh, not quite the best mix. Sometimes the opposites are a little bit better. And in this case, I think we're a good combination of offsetting and complementary skill sets. And so it just organically kind of made sense after, geez, probably about a month or two of just hanging out, talking shop. We were kind of helping each other out with things. He helped build the website for me. And we we're just like, this just makes sense. Like, let's do a deal together. And it was either within that first deal or right after it, they were like, all right, let's actually form a brand, a company, and like do a bunch of stuff together for the long term. So that's how that happened. Okay. I want to add to this. Um, is anybody else out there like super introverted and scared of like events like this? Yeah, 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 I feel you. I would literally drive across town to meet up events just like this. I would get in the parking lot, I would sit there, and then I would turn around and go home and I would count it as a win that I even got to the parking lot. Like, I'm not kidding you guys, like it was bad. And at that event, I was, I, he walked in, he sees me at a table by myself. I walk in, I just see an empty table, and I go, that's my table. No one, no one's table. Yeah, that, that was the last table. So, birds of a feather flock together. What Dan, one of the things that Dan glossed over there is we did not come into the relationship. We didn't walk, we didn't, we didn't walk into the bar and go up to the first lady and be like, you want to get hitched? Doesn't work. 
right? Like we just went up and had a conversation. It was cool. We ended up talking again later. And Dan and I have this thing where one of our core values at Invictus is, the number, number one is we lead with value. So always show up and how do I deliver value first? And we got into, it was kind of competitive, <laughs> uncomfortably so at times, where it's like, who's gonna pay for this meal? Who's gonna pay for this coffee? And it got like to the point where we were like one-upping each other. And then I built you a website because your website sucked. And I was like, I, I, I'm, like I'm gonna win this. Gave you the website and then it was suddenly like, oh my God, like why aren't we working together? Like there's, there's opportunity when we work this well together. So all I'm saying is like, don't go up to somebody and be like, the first time you meet them, I like, want a partner. Like understand like what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, and what exactly are you looking for? And before you can go up and find your ideal partner, you have to first become an ideal partner. So at this point, are you guys in a W2 job or how is the situation? And second, while we are in partnership, I was listening to a podcast and you were talking about you're the visionary and you're the integrator. Yes, that's on my resume. <laughs> so how is the day to day difference from one to the other? Yeah. Good question. So was the first, the first question was, were we still working jobs? Yeah. Okay. And the second question is, in the partnership, what do we each do? Um, <laughs> and you called me a visionary. I appreciate that. Um, I called myself it first. We'll talk about why that is. So the first part of that question, I haven't had a job in a very long time. I've had a number of businesses. The last one, at that time, I was building a manufacturing company called Escape Climbing. We produce rock climbing holds and, and port hardware that build gyms like that. Um, I exited that in 2020 to focus exclusively on Invictus. Dan was full time in real estate at that point. Now in terms of like what we each do, um, the visionary thing, it's really funny because we have a podcast and people will reach out and so we get to see their biographies and the thing that we always laugh at is when it says visionary. It's like, who called you visionary? But then we were, we were building out our business and figuring out what's the, what's the system, what's the framework on which we're gonna build this. And there is no right framework, just so you guys know. The, the right framework is the one you actually use. And the one that we're using for, for Invictus is based off of a book called Traction and the EOS model, the Entrepreneur Operating System. It doesn't have to be that one. If you go and you can use the four Ds of uh, execution, that's a fantastic one that we use at Escape. The key is find one that you can use. And in that book, he makes a distinction that a company needs to have a certain amount of chaos and a certain amount of order. Chaos being the visionary, somebody who can push it forward and have the creative energy and say, this is where we're going. But then the stability, the order to actually execute and implement. And that's where Dan and I tried to swap hats. The interesting thing is that Dan, neither Dan or I are purely visionary or integrator, but that's kind of how we split the rules typically. So Dan will focus a lot on acquisitions, underwriting, running the property management company. I focus more on the marketing, the acquisitions, and like investor relations, acquis acquiring investors, acquiring buildings, and then operating the capital side of the company. So one of the things, I don't know if we mentioned this, but we're vertically integrated, so we have an in-house property management company. So we manage our own assets. We have a staff that manages our residents, deals with repairs and maintenance and all that stuff. Dan oversees that side. I tend to see more of the, the capital side. Any other questions out there? Thank you. Yes, you were. Do you guys work with like other investors? Like have you paired up with like construction company or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, you can ask him if we have any like strategic partnerships, like, hey, let's do a deal with this construction company, they'll do the work for, um, we've looked at that a lot. The closest that we've come to that is a partnership with a, um, a brokerage in downtown called DRG, where we uh, will do some deals in Minneapolis, where their team does the property management, and since they, that's their property management company and their general partner is with us, it's still in-house. Um, I, I want to say that's the only thing we've done uh, yet. We've looked at a lot of other of those, uh, you know, potential strategic partnerships, but I'd say that's probably the only one we've done so far. But that's another way to uh, really be efficient in the partnership game. You know, if you've got somebody who has some kind of sweat equity component that they can bring, whether it's labor um, or, or the management piece or the construction piece, that's, that's a really powerful piece, especially these days. In general, I'd say this kind of, this kind of leads into the comment Anthony made before about not just walking into the bar and, and walking up to saying, someone and saying, hey, do you want to get hitched? 
uh, instead starting with uh, you know trying to you know find those types of people around you and and start a relationship that's not predicated on you trying to partner with them but that's just you trying to learn about them and uncover what it is they're looking for first and kind of focus on that and then hopefully like the partnership element should come at some point and try to kind of lead with what's your problem can i solve that and then at some point they'll realize you are trying to do this thing too and um yeah and we've got a, a core value that's we we lead with value that's our first value and it's yeah I mean, it's tempting because you want to just get to the point, right? And it's an opportunity, so you're excited about it. But at the same time, it's, it's, I think it's usually better to just start with, what's your problem? Can I help you solve that thing? Kind of like Anthony built a website for me. And then naturally after that, I'm like, okay, now what can I do to like, help him out? I'm trying to figure out how I can help this guy. Um, and, and so that's how I had to approach it, approach it from a high level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want, so... Um overwhelm them with value. Figure out what would add value to their life and then add it with no expectation of return, no expectation of a relationship coming out of it. Because when you do something quid pro quo and it's like, hey, I did this thing for you, isn't that really cool? You like that, now you wanna work together? Everybody sees through that. But if you just keep dropping massive value on people, eventually they're gonna feel guilty and they're gonna be like, okay, I'll just work with you, fine. Like that's the key. But the problem is most people, be honest here, has anybody in this room in the last week said to somebody, so how can I add value to you? Has anybody done that? Has anybody, raise your hand, be honest. Yeah, You're like, how can I add value to you? Seems like a really innocent question, but what you've really done is you've given me homework. You've asked me to figure out how you can add value to my life and I don't know you, I don't know. So your power, your skill, if you really wanna get through that door, is figure out what would add value to me without me even knowing, give me the value. That's what I did with Dan. We do this constantly with other individuals is figure out, hey, you seem to be struggling in this way. We can see it from the outside. This isn't as strong as it could be, so let us help you and do this thing. When you do that, people go, holy crap, they're paying attention, and you overwhelm them with value, and then they think, I wanna work with that person. So instead of asking somebody at the end of the conversation, so how can I add value to you? Ask something more like, hey, what are you working on? Like if it's something you don't know, like get a sense for what are they working on and then go home and stalk them ruthlessly to figure out what you can do to help them. Maybe that's making a connection with a broker or a lender or like a construction team. Hey, I know this person over here. You said you had this thing. Because if you have all these great conversations here and then you go home and you do not have any plan for following up with all the people in here, what was the point? What was the point? Like, if you go home and you don't clearly have a vision for, okay, this person here, I talked to this guy, and I talked to that person, I talked to that lady, and, and like, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. That was cool timing. <laughs> is there a dog here? Oh, there is a dog here. Heck yeah. If, if I'm not leaving these and making mental notes of like, okay, I can make a connection here. I'm gonna follow up in an email or a text or a social media, I'm gonna find you and be like, hey, I wanna make a connection. Like, if you're not doing that, then you're not really getting the most out of these opportunities. That's good, I like it. Yeah, the big thing is, actually, we, this came up, we were speaking at St. Thomas the other day to a much younger crowd, and there was a similar question from uh, somebody in the crowd, and the, the main thing I wanted to get across to that younger guy was like, you don't wanna give somebody that you're you know, potentially trying to partner with, or they're asking more for like, I think, in like a mentorship context, but you don't want to give that person a homework assignment. Like try to come up with something I can do for you. Like Anthony said, you want to just do that for them and deliver it and not have them even think about it. But there was another hand up over the street. Uh, I skipped you before, I'm sorry. I want to come back. You good? Okay. Yes. What's your name? Justin. Nice to meet you, Justin. Yeah. What's up? Yeah, so my question is around the lines of somebody starting out in those, that smaller deal range. Yeah. What's your advice when you're not even sure if you can do it and you're talking about getting money from other people and then yeah. you also want to prove to other people maybe ahead of time that you can? Yeah, that's a very good question. I like that you asked that because it can clarify a little bit. I wouldn't suggest raising capital from anybody who's not an active partner until you've really ironed it out. 
Um, if you go out and find a partner who's, I'll, I'll use the phrase joint venture, so that kind of implies that it's you and another guy who are both actively in the deal and you both are, you're active, right? You don't have anybody who's in there passive expecting you to do all the things and generate a profit. I would definitely stay away from that until you've done at least a few deals a decent way through and you've worked the kinks out before you start to raise capital from people, unless you have a partner who's got a track record. Because um, otherwise, it's, it's pretty risky, right? If you screw something up and you lose your money, that's your own problem. And if you've got another actively involved partner, they should know that's a risk that they're taking. But I would definitely suggest that you really get some reps in before you take anybody's money who's passive and they're expecting you to do all the things that produce a return. That, that could be a tricky situation if things go south. Um, if it's two active investors and it goes south, it's a lot easier. But if you take money from somebody that's effectively selling a security, and if you haven't structured it properly, and if you just don't have the track record, then they're going to have uh, probably no issues suing you for whatever they need. So I'd go slow on the raising capital thing, and all you need to do in that department, if you need a capital partner, is just do a smaller joint venture and have them actively involved and just know that you know, you're signing on the loan, we're, we're in this together, and I'm new to this, and hopefully you get that. My family and friends are fine with that because they knew me early on on that you know, third deal. They knew that this was still you know, new for me. So they appreciated the risk, and they got a hell of a good deal. There were no fees. Um, they got treated as if they were earning sweat, sweat equity just like me. So I didn't really structure it in, in my benefit at all. I mainly did that to get practice with investors and kind of go from doing deals by myself to working with investors, knowing I was going to be syndicating. And I wanted, before I did an actual syndication, I wanted to have some experience with investors so I wasn't fresh. So does that answer your question? Um. I firmly believe that you need to pay your tuition at the School of Hard Knocks on your own dime before you ever go take anybody else's money. Like, rewinding back in my life, there was a point when I was $80,000 in debt and living in a van, like, that was not fun. And I remember the value of a dollar and having to do the mental calculus of, do I buy noodles or do I put fuel in my van, slash my home? And so when somebody's giving you money as a passive investor, like, you need to be sure that you can do right by that and you have that experience and you can point to it and say, I know what to do when things are going right and I know what to do when things go wrong because things are going to go wrong. So when you're starting out, I think joint venture, finding somebody who has money and structuring deals in a way that allow you to play long-term games with long-term people. This is a quote from Naval Ravikant. So play long-term games with long-term people. Find somebody who you're okay saying, I'm not gonna make a ton of money on this first deal or second deal or third deal, but I'm gonna get the experience, I'm gonna build a relationship, I'm gonna get the track record. And over time, I'm gonna be able to use that and leverage that. Because real estate is not a get rich quick game. It's the best get rich slowly, but surely plan that there is. So take the long view, take the long horizon. And here's the other thing, when it comes to multifamily, like you'll look on social media and you guys will hear our story and you'll be like, oh my God, like they got so many properties so quickly, that's so great. It doesn't work like that. Like truly, we're, we're glossing over all of the time periods when things weren't going. And so when it comes to buying bigger buildings, it takes time. And if you're just starting now, it could be 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. And if you don't have the stomach to weather that and, and build the, the mental callus to stick it through, you're, not gonna, you're never gonna last in real estate because this is a 30 year plus game. Yeah, the first deal was a doozy. Uh, okay, so we, uh, we, we closed, did we do a podcast episode on this? I mean, we did a podcast episode on nightmare stories and this was in there, but I don't think we did a, a story on this deal. All right, so we closed, yeah. So, um, so we closed on this in January of 2020. Yeah, it was a heavy value add deal with a lot of work to be done, and it was January 2020. So, um, I, I want to make sure I get all your stuff here. So, you want to hear the story of the first deal? Um, I guess I'm kind of curious, like, when you decided to partner, what you were bringing in? Got it. Okay. Yeah, so that first deal that we partnered on, uh, we kind of alluded to this before. When Anthony and I met, we, I had like 30 some units. Uh, you have the triplex, and I had this deal under contract. This was the first syndication that I was doing. It was 32 unit, raising a million for it, which seemed enormous at the time. And I had all but like, what, 100,000, I think, raised when you showed up. And so this was under contract, and I want to say August. 
Yeah, so I put it under contract, went on this uh, five-year anniversary trip with my wife, came back, uh, hit this event, uh, met Anthony there, and it wasn't until probably a month or two later that we really started getting serious, and then we figured that we were partnering on this deal. But I'd gotten to that point, and so the, the majority of the capital raise on that one was me. I, I found the deal um, and got it pretty much up to the finish line, and Anthony came in on that one, and that was really right when we decided we wanted to start working together. And so that one was a little different because we kind of met, met when it was like right at about, right about to hit the finish line. So on that one, I did pretty much all the things. Um, Anthony came in and helped out with the, with the debt on that deal, so he signed on a loan, which helped because this was the biggest deal I'd done yet. And so that uh, helped give a little bit extra oomph uh, to the bank as far as the balance sheet is concerned, so that helped the story. And then really the thing that, that uh, Anthony brought to the table wasn't really on that deal, um, and this is an interesting deal, so we could talk about, a lot about that deal. With the, the partnership relationship with us early on was largely like him really maximizing the marketing side of the business because I was so busy being um, the operator, running the management, raising the capital, doing all these things that the, the website sucked. Uh, the social media presence was okay at best, sporadic. I was doing stuff when I could. It wasn't the utmost quality, and he's a professional writer, so all the copy was written by a finance guy. Okay, I don't know if you've ever written, read something written by a, an accountant. It's not, it's dry, it's not good. Yeah, bullet points. Massive amount of data, no feeling, no emotion, no story. Um, so on that deal, I, a lot of that stuff was largely on me. On deals that we're doing now, it's pretty much an even split on the capital raising. We both kind of hit that. Uh, we both are actively going out looking for deals together. Um, he and our, our marketing whiz over there, Reed, uh, put together the marketing packages. Uh, and help with the webinars and all that stuff. So I'd say that now it's pretty much 50-50. Um, I'm still owning the, uh, the operations, the, the management side and overseeing that and really kind of owning the, the underwriting side. But I'd say most deals that we do now are kind of even split. But that one, like, I was already doing and then we met and then he kind of jumped in the last minute so it was a little bit different. But um, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of things we can talk about on that deal. It's got some stories. There's a lot. Okay. As a fun. Um, I want to ask a question, which is, and this is going to seem like a silly question, but it's actually the very first question that I ask new coaching clients when they come in, they want to learn how to invest in multifamily. Raise your hand if you want to invest in real estate. Okay. Now raise your hand if you want to build a company that invests in real estate. Do you guys understand the difference between those two things? To invest in real estate, all you need to do is give me your money. And I will go and I will buy a building and I will run that building. And it's the whole, it's the whole concept of syndication and like, right? So if you want to invest in real estate, that's one thing. But if you guys want to build a company that invests in real estate, you need to think about it differently and the skills that you need to have. It's not just about the real estate. It's not the building. The building is just a tiny business. And if you don't understand how to run a business, it does not matter if it's real estate or a sneaker shop or an ice cream cone stand. It's a really weird business model. You're not gonna, you're not gonna do good. So you're not gonna do well. So the takeaway there is when Dan and I first started working together on that first deal, it's interesting because Dan didn't really need me on that first deal. And like, honestly, if you didn't invite me into it, I would have been like, whatever. Because him and I were already starting to set the vision for the company that we're building. And the company that we're building is not dependent on us. It's about the team and the systems that we can build around us for that thing to thrive. And so Dan was kind and he let me come into that first deal, but honestly, he could have done it without me. But at that point, we were on a trajectory. We knew the vision of where we want to be in 10, 15, 20 years and the type of business. And he realized to get to that place, we could do it much easier and better together. And so, exactly. Start, you guys, if, you, if you're not asking yourself every single day, what's my outcome? Like, you are probably on the wrong path without even realizing it. Like, if you don't know where you're trying to go to, any path will get you there. And you might not really like where you end up. So ask that question, what's my outcome, all the time. Self-awareness, just audit where you are in the path and the journey right now. Like, like I said before, you'll never outgrow your skills. That's going to be the bottleneck. So figure out what are the skills that you're lacking and how are you going to get them. And you don't have to gain them all. I'm not a spreadsheet wizard. I went and just found Dan. Like, that, that, that's, that worked pretty good. So figure out where you're lacking and then go find your, 
what are they, um, the uh, Brokeback Mountain, you complete me, like the, the piece of the puzzle. I, I don't know, go find, your, go find your game. I know what you're trying to say, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to double down on that, honestly. I could try to come up with something different, but I'd say that that, that component of self-awareness has such, been such a game changer for me because I mentioned before that first year in the business for me was, uh, I don't want to say wasted on ego. I learned a lot, but my mindset was not appropriate because I wanted to say, I own 100% of this. I did all the work. Nobody helped me. I didn't hire a coach. It's all self-taught. I was obsessed with that for some reason. And looking back, I could have done so much more in that year if I hadn't been so fixated on needing to be the one who got 100% credit for everything. Um, and so there's probably some people in this room who might be kind of dealing with a little bit of that too and don't even realize it yet. So like Anthony said, really kind of auditing yourself, figuring out what are you good at, what are you not good at, and also what do you actually enjoy? Because there's a whole bunch of facets to this business so if you're able to identify very clearly what you're good at and what you actually enjoy, you could find a way to carve out your piece where you're just doing that and you're not doing all the things. I think that would lead to a much more successful and enjoyable career. So, um, Our mission is, we do not care if anybody invests with us. Our mission is to make as many people aware of the fact that they can participate in multifamily investing, like, or commercial real estate. Like, there are ways, it's not super daunting and complex. They don't have to build a business around it. So if you guys want a book, if they're, we only brought a couple, but if you guys want one and you don't get one, just shoot me an email and I'll send you one. So, appreciate it, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat>